passed, they've passed what? I mean, every script. Is pre-censorship, though, involved? Are you simply writing easy? In this particular area, no, because we're dealing with a half-hour show, which cannot probe like a 90, which doesn't use scripts as vehicles of social criticism. These are strictly for entertainment. These adult. are pot boilers. Oh, no. Uh -uh. I wouldn't then, call them pot boilers at all. No, these are very adult, uh, I think, high-quality, half-hour, extremely polished films. But because they deal in the areas of fantasy and imagination and science fiction and all, all of those things, uh, there's no opportunity to cop a plea or, or chop an axe or anything. Well, you're not going to be able to cop a plea or chop an axe because you're going to be obviously working so hard on the Twilight Zone that, in essence, for the time being and for the foreseeable future, you've given up on writing anything important for television, right? Yeah. For the, well, uh, again, this is a semantic thing. Important for television? I don't know. If by important you mean I'm not going to try to delve into current social problems dramatically, you're quite right. I'm not. You told Kay Gardella of the New York Daily News this. You said, professionally, I don't think Twilight Zone will hurt me, but I must admit I don't think it'll help me either. I'm stepping out of the line of fire. You've had it as far as trying to beat your brains out. Would you just read me the first two lines, Mike? Professionally, I don't think Twilight Zone will hurt me, but I must admit I don't think it'll help me. Either. I never said that. I'm convinced it'll help me. I have great pride in this show. In 11 or 12 years of writing, Mike, I can lay claim to at least this. I have never written beneath myself. I've never written anything that I didn't want my name attached to. Mm -hmm. I have probed deeper in some scripts, and I've been more successful in some than others. But all of them that have been on, you know, I'll, I'll, take, I'll take my lick. I, I, they're mine, and that's the way I wanted them. Uh, somebody asked me the other day if this means that uh, uh, I'm going to be a, a, uh, a meek conformist. And I, my answer is no. I'm just acting the role of a tired nonconformist. <laughs> And I don't want to. I don't want to fight anymore. Uh, I don't want to. don't want to fight anymore. I don't want to have to battle sponsors and agencies. I don't want to have to push for something that I want and have to settle for second best. I don't want to have to compromise all the time, which in essence is what the television writer does if he wants to put on controversial themes. Well, then why do you stay in television? I stay in television because I think it's very possible to perform a, a function of providing adult, meaningful, exciting challenging drama without dealing in controversy necessarily. This, of course, Mike, is not the best of all possible worlds. I am not suggesting that th this is at the absolute millennium. I think it's criminal that we're not permitted to make dramatic note uh, of, of social evils as they exist, of controversial themes as yeah. they are, are, are inherent in our society. I, I think it's ridiculous that drama, which by its very nature should make a comment, and those things that affect our daily lives is in, the, is in the position, at least in terms of television drama, of not being able to take, these, to take this stand. But this is the, these are the facts of life. This is the way it exists. And they can't look to me or Shayevsky or Rose or Gore Vidal or J.P. Miller or any of these guys as the, as the uh, precipitators of the big change. It's not for us to do it. Let of course, Shayevsky got out of television. Yeah, he did. And I, I, don't, I can't knock that. I think this takes a relative degree of guts to leave a medium that's made you, that's made you a sociable, as a kind of a household name. Patty was the first guy to kind of lend stature to the television writer. Uh, prior to Patty Shayevsky, most of us were considered to be two-headed hacks who worked around the clock and used boy-girl situations in any one of 5,000 different routine manners. But Patty gave us a stature. And I respect Patty's decision to leave. He felt that he wasn't satisfied with doing things Half best. Do you, think, to... do you think you could make it outside of television? Me? Yeah. I'm not sure I could. And I suppose this is an admission of a kind of weakness or at least a sense of insecurity on my part. I've never had a Broadway play produced. What few motion pictures I've written have been somewhat less than spectacular. And I suppose I stay in the medium partly as an admission of... Uh, I, I want to I stay in the womb. This is the medium I understand. These are the tools and techniques that I've been versed in for many years. Right. Maybe I don't want to, you know, get stuck up on the board and get shot at with darts in a Broadway play when I'm not sure I'm prepared for it. But Patty was willing to take the chance. Gore Vidal writes novels. Bob Arthur did Broadway. What about you and Nulls? Ultimately, I'd love to write a novel, and I think next year I'll start my play. Requiem was uh, under option. I was, it was written as a play, and I gave them their money back, and I want to do it over again. But I stay in the medium also because I happen to like the medium. Herb Brodkin, who was a TV producer who was associated with some of your earlier plays, has said this about you. He said, Rod is either going to stay commercial or become a discerning artist, but not both. I remember the quote. Uh, he, got, uh, he, got it, he gave it to Gilbert Milstein when Milstein was doing a profile on me in the New York Times. I didn't understand it at the time. 
I, I fail to achieve any degree of understanding in the ensuing years, which are three in number. If I, I presume uh, Herb means that inherently you cannot be commercial and artistic. You cannot be commercial and quality. You cannot be commercial concurrent with having a, a preoccupation with the level of storytelling that you want to achieve. And this I have to reject. I think you can be, I don't think calling something commercial tags it with a kind of an odious suggestion that it stinks, that it's something raunchy to be ashamed of. I don't think uh, if you say commercial means to be publicly acceptable, what's wrong with that? As long, the, the, the essence of my argument, Mike, is that as long as you are not ashamed of anything you write, be, if you're a writer, as long as you're not ashamed of anything you perform if you're an actor, and I'm not ashamed of doing a television series. I could have, right, I could have done probably 30 or 40 film series over the past five years. I, I presume at least I've turned down that many mm -hmm. with, uh, with great guarantees of cash, with great guarantees of, of financial security, but I've turned them down because I didn't like them. I did not think they were quality, and God knows they were commercial. Uh, but I think uh, innate in what Herb says is this suggestion made by many people that you can't have public acceptance and still be artistic. And I, as I say, I have to reject that. One of your most recent plays was one called The Velvet Alley, right? Right. It was about the corrupting influences of Hollywood and big money. Right. Where'd that come from? Your own experiences? Many. Part of it was very autobiographical. Part of it was a composite of, other, of, of observation of other people involved. Well, what do you mean by the corrupting influence of Hollywood and big money? What does that what, well, what I didn't, saying? I didn't mean to suggest that, that corruption had a geographical tag, that it was necessarily no. the corruption of Hollywood. What I tried to suggest dram dramatically was that when you get into the big money, particularly in the kind of detonating, exciting, explosive, overnight way that our industry permits, there are certain blandishments that a guy can succumb to, and many do. Such as? Uh, a preoccupation with status, with the symbols of status, with the heated swimming pool that's 10 feet longer than the neighbors, with the big car, with the concern about billing, uh, all these things. In a sense, rather minute things, really, in context, but th that become disproportionately large in a guy's mind. And also, because those become so large, what becomes small I think probably the really valuable things, and I know this sounds corny and, and no. so buckwheatish to say that things like having a family, being concerned with raising children, being concerned with where they go to school, being concerned with a good marital relationship, all these things I think are of the essence. Uh, unfortunately, and the problem as I tried to dramatize in the Velvet Alley, was that the guy who makes a success is immediately assailed by everybody. And you suddenly find yourself having to compromise along the line, giving so many hours to work and a disproportionate number of fewer hours to family. Yeah. And this is inherent in our business. How many hours a day do you work right now as executive producer and or writer on? 12 to 14 hours a day. How many days a week? Seven. Uh -huh. And uh, I don't mean now seriously, I'm not asking for figures here, but obviously the Twilight Zone is your own creation. You're doing it for money. I think that our audience would be fascinated to know. And again, I, I, I don't want to get too specific, but uh, how rich can a fella get under these circumstances? Well, if the show is successful, he can get tremendously rich. He can make a half a million dollars, I suppose. Half a million dollars of what? A year? Uh, over a period of three or four years, I suppose, yeah. But Mike, I, I'm not... Th again, this sounds defensive and it probably sounds phony, but I'm not nearly as concerned with the money to be made on this show as I am with the quality of it, and I can prove that. Uh, I have a contract with Metro Goldwyn Mayer which guarantees me something in the neighborhood of a quarter of a million dollars over a period of three years. This is a contract I'm trying to break and get out of so I can devote time to a series which is very iffy, which is a very problematical thing. It's only guaranteed 26 weeks, and if it only goes 26 weeks and stops, I'll have lost a great deal of money. But I would rather take the chance and do something I like, something I'm familiar with, something that has a built-in challenge to it. It's even possible, though, that if it is a success, you could make well over the $2 million that you suggested right. four and years, I, a half a million apiece. Quite right, but I happen to feel after a year and a half of working 12 to 14 hours a day, it's worth it. And I think I rate it. I think anybody does who works that hard and can create an idea and can, and can uh, make a show go.